Hello everyone, I'm E.T. and welcome to a new series I'm starting called E.T.'s Fundamentals. This series is something I thought of while working on my how-to blending modes and filter gallery videos. The how-to video format I came up with didn't really work when giving huge amounts of info like I did in those videos, and those videos are focused on techniques with an assumption of already knowing the theory behind them, so I decided another show was in order. I'll still be doing how-to videos, though depending on how much I enjoyed this format, I might might make some changes to those as well. Fundamentals will basically be a vodcast focusing on 101 and theory. For our first episode, we'll be going over the Adobe Creative Suite today. Specifically, what the most popular programs are and are not for. To demonstrate what I'm saying, I'll be using the process of making and rendering the very video you're watching and listening to right now. So without further ado, let's get started. First, we'll talk about the graphic design programs. These are Bridge, Photoshop, Illustrator, and InDesign. We'll be starting with Bridge. Bridge acts like a sort of hub for all your files and links Photoshop, InDesign, and InCopy together so you can work seamlessly between the three of them. You can use it to find and sort your projects, images, and audio and video files. You can preview your assets, open Camera Raw, and edit the metadata of all your files. This lets you easily organize all the files you're using and manage their copyright information. So we're starting with a very brief overview, but the program really isn't that complicated. From here we'll move on to the most used and commonly known program in the suite, Photoshop. No matter what kind of project you're doing, you will end up using Photoshop for some part of it. From photography, to photo manipulations, to removing wires and red eye from shots and films, to map paintings for films, Photoshop is made for almost all of your graphical needs. I say almost because it does have a limit in that it's made for what are known as roster graphics. Roster graphics are made of pixels, and because they're made of pixels, they're limited in size before they start getting blurred edges and colors. What that means is that Photoshop is great for photography and digital painting. What it's not supposed to be used for are the other kind of graphics, which we'll go over along with Illustrator now. Illustrator is, as the name suggests, for illustration. But I just said you could do paintings in Photoshop, so what's the point? But when you make something in Photoshop, if you try to scale it, it's going to get blurred edges, known as aliasing. The bigger it gets, the more blurred all of the edges and colors will be. And it doesn't even need to just be resizing. Just moving a graphic in Photoshop can cause some aliasing, which I feel like not enough people point out. Vector graphics, on the other hand, are algorithm-based pieces of data, and what that means in layman's terms is you can scale them nearly infinitely based on how much data your computer has. In Illustrator, you can make an illustration, and that illustration can scale down to an inch-by-inch inch square, or a wall decal for the exterior of a three-story building, and still look sharp either way. There are very, very few objective you-need-to-do-this-this-way things when it comes to design and art, but one of them is that Photoshop is not for logos and text. Illustrator should be your go-to for all logos and icons. You can also do anti-alias vector text in there, but we'll actually be going over a tool made for text next. InDesign is Adobe's publications program. If you've ever read anything that's been published, either a magazine or a newspaper, or if you've ever even looked at book covers on a shelf, it's gone through InDesign or a very similar program known as Quark Express. While you can do text in most of Adobe's programs, most of them are roster, which is not good because it doesn't scale well, as I pointed out. InDesign is the program for text layout design for advertising and publishing. If you're doing graphic design and advertising, this is often the end destination where you bring all of your photos, illustrations, icons, and logos together to make your final ads, whether it's for print, product, or web. As with all these programs, InDesign can do a lot more that I'm not really covering in this brief overview, but I do have plans to go over all of them in depth later on. So those are the graphic design programs of the suite. Next comes the audio and video programs.
for video editing, the process can start in any program, so we'll just go along with my process for making this video. Because I was recording my monologue for this instead of just dropping some Kevin McLeod into one of my how-to videos, my first stop was Adobe Audition. Audition is the suite's audio program. Inside here, you can record audio and add in sound clips, and then add effects and edits to them. It has presets for different kinds of audio productions, from podcasts, like the one I'm using right now, and CDs to film scenes, complete with video preview. With the CC update, you can even do text-to-speech generation directly in the program, which can then be edited the same as any other audio. You can use this program for any audio and mixing needs, though if you're not looking to pay the monthly cost and don't mind losing the flair, Audacity is a completely free open source alternative. Once I had my audio for the show all recorded and mixed, I took it into Premiere, the nonlinear video editing software. Nonlinear editing is a technical term for non destructive editing of videos, as opposed to linear editing, which involves cutting, editing, and stitching analog videotapes back together. In Premiere, you can put all your video, audio, animations, all of it together, and then edit them into a cohesive of peace. As shown here, to make the video you're watching, I put my opening animation, multiple screen capture videos, my monologue, bed music, and audio effects together. If you're looking to do video editing, this or Final Cut are probably your go-to. That said, it can't do everything. I look at it as a final step in the process because you really can't do special effects in it. It's almost solely for editing your pieces together, and while you can do some minor things, the program for adding in effects is After Effects. While I had my videos put together, I wanted to have dividers for each section, as you've been seeing. I could make something like that in Premiere, but animation and special effects are really After Effects point. In this case, I used it for some motion type and compositing a background together underneath all of that to add a bit more flair and organization to the final piece. But After Effects is an incredible program for any of your special effect needs, assuming that you don't need to do real 3D effects. For the last AV program, I should mention that Premiere is built to accept After Effects compositions as usable footage, treating them like smart objects as I've explained in my how-to video on those. That's what I actually did for this video, but for demonstration purposes, I'll also go a bit into the Media Encoder. Media Encoder is an encoding engine for Premiere and After Effects. Encoding in video production is the process of taking your program files and making them into video files you can use and upload. If you're just rendering a clip or two, you can do that from inside Premiere and After Effects, but the encoder is capable of what's called batch processing which makes it more efficient. In it, you can render multiple files in multiple formats at the same time. You can also run comps and files through the program without opening After Effects or Premiere, which is a little bit more efficient on your system's RAM. For the next step in the process, I moved on to rendering the video, and while that was going on, I worked on the post for my Musings blog that'll be going with this video. For web design, Adobe has two programs, which is good because when they were developing the Edge, they had seven. Thankfully, they've taken the features of the Edge and will be implementing them into the two main programs, Muse and Dreamweaver. We'll start with Muse. Muse serves as InDesign, but made for web design. Created with graphic designers in mind, Muse is for laying out and designing your site. Arguably, it does have better tools for designing a site than Dreamweaver, and even comes with a built-in ability to design multiple pages inside of one project. That said, it's definitely for graphic designers and not necessarily for web designers. The tagline for the program is create gorgeous custom websites without writing code on the Adobe site. That sounds great, right? Well, yes and no. It can be awesome if you're looking to save time and not worry about knowing how to code the site to function. It takes care of all the coding for you, to the point that you can't even touch any code in the program, at least as of now, which is the problem. When something goes wrong with your site, and something will always go wrong when you're building a site, there's no way to easily fix it inside of Muse. 
On top of that, the HTML code that Muse puts out is kind of a nightmare. Dreamweaver, on the other hand, is made as a general purpose program for web designers and developers. You can design sites inside of it while also being able to access all of the code. Things you create inside of it can also have coding that's not the best, but it's leaps and bounds above what Muse produces while still being able to generate some of the code for you to save yourself some time. It also comes with built-in templates for various kinds of sites, including pre-built responsive designs to plug your content into. Now this isn't to say you need either of these programs. The beautiful thing about web design and development is that if you know how the code works, you can build a site using napkin sketches and notepad on Windows or text edit on a Mac or any of the nearly 50 open source alternatives to Dreamweaver. Personally, I'm more comfortable designing in Photoshop or sometimes even in the browser itself using an open source program called Brackets, which Adobe will be adding into Dreamweaver sometime in 2016. And that was the first episode. There were some programs I didn't cover, but even glossing over some of them, I did cover all the major ones and I had a seven page script, so I wanted to keep things manageable for a first attempt at this. Hopefully I did manage to get across the basic purposes for all the ones I did cover though, and that was really the goal. While you can mix and match them, each program does serve a purpose, and this was partially inspired by seeing tutorials online teaching people how to design logos in Photoshop, which is something you should really never do, and I cannot emphasize that enough. I hope everyone's enjoyed it as much as I loved making it. I'm definitely planning on doing more. I would love it if people commented on this video, letting me know what they think I could have done better, or what I did pretty well. You can also like the video to let me know, or subscribe to my channel for more awesome content. And with that, have a great day, everyone.